So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the seminar on innovation and agriculture, how intersectoral collaboration can enhance agricultural innovation. My name is Tomoko Tina Kimura. And now to begin, Mr. Susumu Hamamura, the Parliamentary Vice Minister of the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries will deliver the opening remarks on behalf of the organizers. Mr. Hamamura, please. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to express my appreciation for your participation in the seminar on innovation and agriculture hosted by MAF. I also sincerely welcome the delegates to the G20 Niigata Agricultural Ministers meeting. Thank you for coming all the way to Japan. The ministers the ministers' meeting will start this afternoon. As you know, the main theme of this year's meeting is toward sustainable agro-food sector, emerging issues, and good practices. Under the theme, we aim to share our views on how to address various global challenges that agriculture is now facing with G20 members and beyond. Today, in Japan, the aging of farmers is becoming an issue. The average age of business farmers is now over 65. At the same time, overall population in Japan is all, uh, now decreasing. Now, uh, sorry. Business farmer is now over 65. At the same time, overall population in Japan is now decreasing. Therefore, how to increase agricultural productivity is one of the main policy issues. While past G20 meetings mainly focused on the importance of innovation and development of technology, we believe that collaboration between agricultural and non-agricultural sectors, such as satellite technology, IoT, and AI, has a key role to play in fostering agricultural innovation. Certainly, much technology and know-how developed in non-agricultural sectors will bring enormous benefits to agricultural sectors. Recognizing this, our ministry is now promoting collaboration between agricultural and non-agricultural sectors to generate innovative solutions to address challenges we face. The platform we call Field of Knowledge Integration and Innovation is a typical example in order to enhance public-private academia partnership. Today's seminar is full of interesting programs. It starts with a keynote speech by the Honorable Sonny Perdue, Secretary of Agriculture, the United States of America, followed by presentations by pioneers who have succeeded in intersectoral collaboration, a report from the OECD, and the panel discussion. Last but not least, I hope you touch upon some of the achievements of Japanese intersectoral collaboration and take advantage of this opportunity for finding future solutions to agricultural issues. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Hamamura. And now I would like to welcome the United States Secretary of Agriculture, the Honorable Sonny Perdue, to deliver the keynote speech. 
Secretary Perdue was born in a farming family in Georgia. He is also a veterinarian. He has always emphasized the need for innovation in agricultural policies. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Perdue. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Hamamura, for uh, your opening remarks and your welcome. Uh, while I may fit in that demographic of your aging farmer, I'm inspired by your youthful uh, future of agriculture here in Japan, and uh, congratulations. And uh, I, on behalf of the United States, would like to congratulate Japan and the OECD on the topic of uh, the completion of the Innovation, Agricultural Productivity, and Sustainability in Japan, the report which is the subject of this meeting. Nothing could be more important to feed a hungry and growing world for their future. Japan joins the United States and 10 other OECD member states in developing these reports, which provide a foundation for data-driven policy, making uh, to benefit farmers and consumers, not only in our own nations, but with trading partners around the world, and certainly our trading customers around the world. By the year 2050, we know the statistics. The world's population is expected to be more than 9 billion people, and that presents a life and death challenge for many in undeveloped situations. The motto that I use from our department and more than 100,000 employees in the USDA in America sums up this in a very few simple words that I'd like to share with you. It says, do right and feed everyone. We believe that is our calling, and I believe it's a noble challenge for all of us involved in agricultural production. In order to accomplish this goal of feeding everyone, we must produce more. We're seeing amazing breakthroughs in science and food production. Every day, we are learning new ways to produce more to feed the world thanks to the wonders of technology. Crops and livestock breeders, both public and private, are increasingly utilizing innovative breeding techniques. Plant scientists can now create new plant varieties that are indistinguishable from those developed through conventional breeding methods. In a few are growing seasons and with greater precision and greater locality uh, attributes specific to a region. Amazing technology. These new approaches to plant breeding include methods like genome editing. They present tremendous opportunities for farmers and consumers alike. They make available plants with traits that can protect crops against threats like drought and diseases. They can increase nutritional value and reduce allergens. We're not only making food bigger and better, but we're improving food safety all along the way. And I would submit to you, I think this technology also gives us the opportunity as agricultural producers and food producers to literally use food as health and therapy in the future. I believe we're on the cusp of another technology revolution. We're seeing amazing breakthroughs from a scientific and a technological perspective. Sensors, optics, measurements, that I like to call the digitization of agriculture and technological perspective. It's unfortunately, all of our colleagues across the world arena don't seem to want to embrace the modernization of agriculture. And I'm concerned that we see a growing movement, which I have deemed a fear your food movement. I use a proverb often that goes much like this. It says, when man is hungry, he has one problem. But when man has enough to eat, he has many problems. I'm concerned that the affluence of our developed countries have developed many problems in relationship to the paranoia of the safety of our food. The United States supports science-based assessments of food, feed, and environmental safety. Regulatory processes and decisions should be science and risk-based, transparent, and predictable and replicatable. This type of regulatory approach fosters innovation and contributes to a safe 
and reliable global food supply. The United States-Mexico-Canada agreement is breaking new ground in trade agreements by including language that actively supports a 21st century innovations in agriculture, such as genome editing. It enhances information exchange and cooperation on agricultural biotechnology trade-related matters. Argentina has developed a risk-based regulatory approach that is stimulating innovation within their country. Brazil has also developed a risk-based approach, and they too are seeing amazing results. Unfortunately, some countries are lagging behind. Recently, a donation of U.S. food into a developing country's school feeding program was blocked. It is the same food that I and other Americans eat every day and have been eating for years, and you can see it works. Why was it blocked? Simply because of a biotech event or content. Think about that. Despite over two decades of safe use of agricultural biotechnology, in 2019, fear of technology is leaving children undernourished, and I consider that immoral. Some vocal groups are promoting a paranoia about food that's totally unfounded. Consumers should never have to fear their food, and policies should certainly not encourage unfounded fear. I believe it is a role of governments to provide sound science, not political science facts about fear, about food, to their constituencies. Nobel Peace Prize winner, winner Dr. Norman Borlaug, is credited with saving countless lives. Two decades ago, he said that we have the capability to feed 10 billion people. But the more pertinent question is, will we permit our farmers and growers to use the technology that can achieve that? A 2016 report by the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation estimated that the suppression of biotech innovations cost the African agricultural economy $2.5 billion between 2008 and 2013 and could cost lower income countries $1.5 trillion between 2015 and 2050. That defines immorality. The advances in agriculture and technology are literally life-saving. It is vital for governments to implement science-based policies and regulations to keep pace with science and trade policies must allow fair, fast, and safe distribution of food. We can no longer use and deny these technologies in a protectionist environment. FAO data confirms that developing countries with more open trade <clears throat> have lower levels of undernourishment. Well-functioning markets strengthen food security. They provide new economic opportunities. Protectionism hurts everyone and feeds no one. Can I say that again? Protectionism hurts everyone and feeds no one. G20 countries should find ways to facilitate trade in food and agricultural products. We can lead the way together to promote trade by enhancing the standardization of quality and safety standards and development of durable, trusted institutions. Then we all win. Increase trade opportunities, foster investment, encourage technological development and innovation, and further integrate networks of producers and consumers. As G20 agricultural ministers, we have important responsibilities to ensure availability of food for our citizens and for our neighbors around the world. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. I know that the meetings this weekend will help us to fulfill our motto, and I hope your motto as well, to do right and feed everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Perdue. And may I announce that Mr. Hamamura and Secretary Perdue are now leaving as they have other engagements. Ladies and gentlemen, let us once more put our hands together to thank them. Thank you very much.
Now we would like to start part one of the seminar. Two pioneers will present their experiences through intersectoral collaboration. First, I would like to invite Mr. Hirotomo Nagai, founder and CEO of Watercell Inc., for a presentation on smart agriculture in Japan and case study of our collaborative partnership. Mr. Nagai, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Nagai with the Water Cell Inc. I'm going to talk about smart agriculture in Japan and case study of our collaborative partnership. So this is my personal profile. I'm from Niigata Prefecture. I went to Nagaoka Engineering uh, Technical School. And then I went to Niigata University to study information engineering. So I am of a science background. Uh, since I was in elementary school, I was always uh, working on the PC. However, in 21, I had an encounter with uh, farmers, and I started uh, farming. Not the farming itself, but I started as an ICD project in agriculture. Since then, I have been involved as an ICT in agriculture, uh, in agriculture last year, not just working at the desktop using PC. Uh, we started uh, also uh, a vegetarian farm as well for sweet potatoes. So now, the project itself started in 2010, and this is very interesting. Therefore, in 2011, I made it a company. So within Niigata City, we have been conducting activities. There are 32 staff members. Product is uh, farm management software, product management software, so which is called AgriNode. So that is a product. AgriNode project or product is something I'd like to introduce to you. In 2010, uh, in Niigata Industrial Creation Organization, I uh, referred a uh, agri uh, farmers to me uh, concerning their con uh, talking about their concerns. That's why I started uh, this uh, project. Their concerns were uh, that are peculiar to Japanese uh, fields. There are too many cultivated lands, and uh, they have to manage a very small size cultivated lands. This many fields are available. So they cannot remember where their fields are, and uh, how much uh, say fertilizer they have used is something very difficult to remember. They cannot uh, gather data either. There was no software to manage that at the time. So I uh, supplied this agri node, and so that was the start of the project. The background to this is there are many people who are withdrawing from agriculture. So young people are going to keep these uh, many fields. And so they keep a large number of small uh, lots of uh, fields. AgriNode basic information that we handle is the following part. And so there are agricultural fields. Uh, they should be registered. So those uh, blocks are drawn. And then the uh, field name will be attached, like field one, field two, and so on and so forth. Then uh, crops information are, is going to be registered, for example, sweet potato, for example. And uh, also species can be also um, designated as well. This is koshi hikari uh, rice as well. So in terms of daily information, for example, field six in here, what kind of work has been done is recorded. Date, work item, who did it, how many hours did they work. If a fertilizer was used, and then the name of the fertilizer, as well as the amount, uh, as well as uh, uh, the uh, type of fertilizer and neighbor can be registered as well. Also, agriculture machines can be registered as well, photos as well, memos as well. So for farm and uh, crops, uh, you, you, uh, the agri node can register all these items. So how we are going to look at this information? 
it is very important to get to know where the field is. And so just at a glance, you can tell on the map where the fields are and what kind of props are there can be also identified as well. In terms of the harvest schedule, it can be registered as well. Progress of work, uh, whether fertilizer was applied or not, can be uh, color uh, can be identified by different colors. Times of fertilization as well, as well as uh, time, the number of uh, uh, cases of uh, pesticide spraying as well can be identified. This type of information is very important. If more than necessary uh, chemical is a spray, then uh, it would impact upon the shipping. Therefore, the basic information can be input using tablet and smartphones. For optimizing the fields, what should we be doing further? Smartphones and tablet uh, information is not enough. Therefore, what I came up with is uh, we need to take into account the environment, the soil and meteorological conditions. Uh, what are the work that has been done and how they have grown? What were the crop and what were the ingredients? And so we needed to uh, capture all such information, which is be leading to science-based uh, agriculture. Uh, since I am a software engineer, I am not an agriculture machine uh, mechanical engineer, so therefore I needed to obtain uh, cooperation from other people. So IoT sensor devices, sensor technologies have been progressing very much. So I wanted to utilize them in order to optimize the production of uh, agricultural fuels. Uh, these are the things I worked on. So let me give you one example. As for agriculture machine, Uh, sensors uh, will be mounted on the um, agriculture machines nowadays. This is a rice planting, uh, rice planter, not just the rice planting, but the soil conditions can be measured as well to conduct uh, rice planting. And so checking uh, the conditions of the soil, so optimal fertilizer amount can be measured or automatically controlled to apply fertilizers. So you can reduce the growth and evenness. This type of information can be checked on the AgriNode as well. So this is another of the collaboration. Not just the production information, uh, GPS information, NS, uh, GNSS, uh, where the uh, agriculture machines are being operated, whether they are in trouble and so on, can be also captured as well. And uh, you can also uh, check how the veteran farmers uh, did. And then uh, young farmers can learn from the veteran farmers' uh, handling. So the labor position should be this way. And, uh, and so this can work as a learning kit as well. So in that way, uh, the agricultural information is uh, visible on this node, agri node. Not if, if you deal with only agricultural manufacturer only, uh, then that is not enough because uh, farmers are, uh, have uh, equipment from various uh, companies' uh, equipment, and uh, we can now uh, manage the fuse using Mitsubishi, uh, Mahindra, and Iseki Company Limited uh, uh, agriculture machines. Next, next is the uh, satellite collaboration. Hyperspectral, multispectral camera are mounted on the satellite, and we can get the information from there. We can get to know the growth of the crops. For example, soybeans, wheat, uh, pasture grass, rice, uh, against that the report types are available. Uh, what would be the growth diagnosis and uh, harvest timing diagnosis? What about the moisture content, the uh, uh, protein content? Such uh, information can be all visible. And against that, what will be then uh, a fertilization level, and so you can make a judgment following such information. Veteran farmers uh, would simply say that, well, now is the season, so let's do this one. Uh, but the young farmers might say that uh, looking at the data, that, the, oh, this is something we should be doing. So even without having uh, much experience, uh, uh, the young farmers can get to a certain level to conduct their work. And uh, we have been uh, collaborating with Coke Cycle Company Limited, and we are currently uh, working on other uh, manufacturers as well. This is the example of drone. We can do similar things as a satellite. Uh, the uh, growth uh, diagnosis can be done. In the case of drone, it can fly very close to the field. High resolution images are available. Then, 
、uh, leaf color diagnosis, and if there are weeds or some diseases, and then we can visually see them. So that can、uh, lead to a more efficient work. So by sensing uh, this, uh, the conditions of fields, the uh, young uh, farmers can do the same level quality work as the veterans. This is the sensor. Uh, for example,、uh, the harvesting and、uh, water loss,、uh, this kind of thing is a very important to identify、uh, such information. And as I mentioned at the outset,、uh, there are many small sized、uh, fields, but、uh, it will be enormous work to、uh, go over all those、uh, fields. But you can use the sensors to check、uh, whether there is a water loss. And if there is a water loss, you can just get to the site and、uh, Uh, supply water. So, in that way, these sensors can be used in order to ensure quality of production. So, in this way, I have introduced、uh, some of the cases、uh, we work、uh, with some companies, but this should be integrated. So, there is a Niigata agricultural zones are currently being utilized. So, all the processes are tested in this way, and we did it last year. And the farmers, Komehachi,、uh, also extended cooperation to us、uh, starting from rice planting. And、uh, since a combined、uh, planter was used and、uh, growing,、uh, was、uh, also monitored by using satellite. And、uh, if、uh, fertilizing is needed, we did that in harvesting as well. Since uh, uh, enabled combines were used to come up with the use、uh, in a numerical Way we were able to identify them. So we studied that last year, and we are currently discussing a data driven farm management for the second year. Not just limited to Niigata Prefecture, nationwide,、uh, we wanted to do this kind of project. Then, MAF, Ministry of Agriculture, Forest, and Fisheries, are pushing for this kind of project. They're going to start such a project this year. So we'll be joining such a project. So, nationwide,、uh, we like to build up、uh, smart agriculture cases. Like this, AgriNode. Of course,、uh, there is the information that farmers input, but sensing information can be fully utilized to create a future agriculture. But going beyond that is、uh, production information can be available by sensing uh, devices, uh, well, harvest schedule, crops information,、uh, what about the green,、uh, ingredients, and so on and so forth. And so it can be used for production. But there is a peripheral industry people can use such information as well.、Uh, for example, agriculture materials people can use such information. So, what kind of materials should be supplied?、Uh, what would be the amount of such agricultural materials? Such uh, uh, information would be very useful for that. At the, toward the end of the value chain, we can also utilize such information because we can know the information quality. Then,、uh, restaurants and supermarkets、uh, can purchase、uh, items in a planned manner. So, in that way,、uh, not just limited to the agriculture industry, but、uh, secondary tertiary industries will be also positively impacted as well. In that way, the society per se is going to become more smart. So, In that sense as well, I think agriculture is a very important arena. So, we'd like to push ahead、uh, with this、uh, project. So, I'd like uh, uh, you to familiarize yourself with this project so that the many, a large number of farmers will be able to use uh, these uh, technologies. Thank you very much.、Uh, we would now like to take some time for some questions and answers.、Uh, please raise your hands if you would like to ask a question. A staff will hand you a microphone. Do we have any questions in, from the audience? Uh, yes, we do. Hold on.、Uh, here comes the staff. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation.、Uh, I'm from Indonesia. Uh, I would like to ask、uh, how d o e s the farmers, especially the young farmers,、uh, read、uh, all the data that has been collected?、Uh, do they have a special training, or、uh, how d o e s the, also the uh, farmers uh, gather the、uh, information? Is there any、um, 
people who collect the data uh, to the farmers. Thank you. In terms of uh, information on agricultural production, I think it is twofold. For example, the information that farmers input uh, agricultural chemicals and how much are they used, so they can uh, input such information as a report. They can use the uh, smartphones and tablets in that way, so farmers themselves can input such information. The other is a sensing device used information. In this case, a satellites or drones can be used. Uh, there are uh, different, uh, say, vendors or manufacturers. So they uh, gather data and observe, and so they uh, provide such information. So such information is provided externally. But how to look at data, how to utilize data on this point, uh, there are still many farmers who are not used to that. And so uh, there are uh, guiding people as well. So we need to, uh, say, uh, you know, make approach to farmers as to uh, guide them. Uh, this will conclude the Q&A session and our presentation from Mr. Nagai. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we would like to welcome Dr. Takahiro Nozaki, Assistant Professor of the Faculty of Science and Technology of Keio University, for a presentation on productivity improvement by advanced robot technology using tactile information. Dr. Nozaki, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to talk to you in this uh, wonderful and uh, great uh, conference. Uh, I'm, an Taka I'm Takahiro Nozaki, and I'm an assistant professor at Keio University, Japan. Uh, the main topic of my presentation is sense of touch. Uh, if you don't have any sense of touch, uh, you will break everything you touch, since uh, you cannot recognize whether your finger is touching or not. Maybe you don't um, notice in your daily life, um, all you always, always adjust the applied force uh, to adapt to the various objects in the external world. So, uh, uh, tactile information is very, very important, and it's uh, necessary, especially in contact motion. Um, the most simple way to uh, obtain tactile information is using tactile sensors, like force sensors. Let me, introduce, uh, let me introduce the uh, principle of the force sensors. Uh, force sensors uh, deform if force is applied to the sensors. And the deformation is measured uh, by the electrical ray. From the uh, measure of the deformation, we can calculate how much force is applied to the force sensors. Uh, however, due to the uh, principle, uh, the force sensors easily break uh, when excessive force is applied to that. So there, uh, actually, there is a lot of uh, drawbacks, not only um, easiness to break down, but also a cost problem and also size problem. In addition to that, um, even if we can measure the actual force by robust force sensors, we have to uh, decide how much force should be applied to the target object. It's quite difficult, and I think it's almost uh, impossible. Uh, next, let me introduce our technology. Uh, we have a technology to estimate and control the applied force without using any force sensors. Uh, as all you know, the electrical motors rotate when current flows. And when the uh, motor makes a contact with something, the load force is applied to the motor. Uh, by estimating this load force, we can acquire a force information without using any force sensors. 
From now on, I'd like to introduce several examples of the actual applications. First one is a uh, um, teleoperation system. Please look at this movie. Uh, this is an operator, and this is a dual um, robotic system. The view the operator is watching is the same as the, the image of the uh, robot is watching. And the sounds coming to the robotic side is transmitted to the operator side. The uh, most important thing, important factor of this system is transmission of tactile sensation. When the, this robotic system, sorry, this is operator, and uh, when this robot grasps something, the uh, force, actual force or the actual stiffness is transmitted to the operator side. The operator can feel the actual force and the stiffness as if uh, the operator is grasping the balloon. And you can see that the operator's motion is synchronized with that robot, robot motion. And here there is a set of plastic cups. By applying strong force, the robot can grasp all of the plastic cups at the same time. And by adjusting the grasping force, this robot can also uh, grasp only one plastic fragile cup. By using the tactile information, uh, the robot can adjust the grasping force not to break this very soft and fragile plastic cup. And also, um, even if water is poured into the glass, the robot can keep holding the cup. This is adaptability of the robotic system. Uh, OK, um, this is the actual robotic hand we developed. OK, when you rotate this bar, then the, this robotic hand uh, open and close. And uh, Yeah, and now he can feel the actual uh, stiffness and force through this device. Okay, thank you. Could you go back to the presentation slide again? Okay, thank you. Uh, we propose a new concept, which is referred to as Internet of Actions. In this concept, firstly, the um, human motion information and also physical object information uh, is acquired through teleoperation system. And then, secondly, uh, the obtained information is edited. And finally, the uh, modified information is transmitted and reproduced in the robotic system. Uh, actually, uh, this technology was originally developed for uh, surgery applications. But now, the, the applic application field is not limited in medical field. Let me introduce another example. This is fruit sorting system. These are rotten fruits, very soft and damaged. Uh, conventional robots cannot uh, handle this kind of soft fruits since uh, any tactile information technology uh, is not implemented. So uh, like this movie, uh, we need a lot of workers but it's a very serious problem. Uh, as you know, Japan is facing a, a problem of aging society with foreign birth rate, so we have to automate this operation. Uh, this is a, a fruit sorting system we developed. By transferring flexible uh, human motions to this robotic system, we succeeded to automate this uh, fruit sorting operation. These are uh, the target oranges. This is uh, before grasping, and this is after grasping. Um, from these figures, we can confirm that this system can handle the fruits without damaging them. And now we collaborate with more than uh, 50 companies for commercialization. This is one example. It's a real-time viscometer. It's a collaborative work with um, uh, Yokogawa Electric Corporation, uh, which is a Japan company. 
uh, here, uh, one electric motor is mounted to mix the liquid. And uh, from the relationship between the velocity information and the force information, we can calculate uh, viscosity characteristics. And that is visualized and uh, represented in this monitor. Next example is remote monitoring system with next generation communication system, which is referred to as 5G communication. Uh, this white robot, uh, this is uh, called as Pepper, uh, developed by SoftBank Corporation. Uh, human motion is connected with and synchronized with the white robot. Then we can um, do several operations from the remote side. This is uh, avatar fishing. There are two fishing rods here, and uh, if uh, one rod is lo located on the uh, near the sea, and if a uh, fish apply some force to the fishing lot, this operator can feel the actual force as if you are fishing uh, the place near the sea, like this. And uh, it's an uh, example of construction equipment. Uh, this operator can feel the actual grasping force, and the human motion is amplified and transmitted to this system. In this case, the applied force is very strong, very uh, big. So uh, we uh, applied this technology to the hydraulic driven system. Uh, this is application of uh, uh, space development, collaboration with JAXA. Uh, by using this uh, manipulation manipulator, we can handle various objects in the uh, outside of the uh, space uh, station from inside of the space station. And you know, outside of the sp space station is very dangerous. So uh, I believe we can change the uh, future of the agriculture and uh, we will uh, realize uh, automated agriculture, uh, visualized agriculture, remote agriculture, powerful agriculture, and safe agriculture. Finally, let me summarize my presentation. Uh, my technology started, originally started for uh, medical applications. Our technology can generate human-like, adaptive, and kind motions. And now the productivity improvement is progressing by cooperating with different, uh, different and various fields. Okay, thank you for your kind uh, listening. That's all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nozaki. Now we have some time for some questions and answers. Uh, would anyone like to ask a question? Translation provided. Anyone? From Austrian and Embassy, thank you very much for very interesting presentation. Robots advanced to this level perhaps could contribute to the problem of the lack of human resources, particularly required for picking the fruits and so forth. But in reality, there are a field design which has to be modified to accommodate with the robot's operation. So um, how to select the variety or how to plant the trees? And are you also investigate in the field uh, layout area? Let me answer in Japanese. Well, preparing the field for the purpose of robotics is really costly. Therefore, at the minimum, for several decades, we have to prepare the fields where the human and robots both will be able to operate, which means that the robots which can operate like humans are required. And this robots will is adaptable to the external environment. That is very important. If environment is consistent all across, for example, the size and the hardness of the fruit is all consistent across the board. And it's like uh, buying water from vending machines. And in the same manner, you will be able to pick the fruits. However, how well you will align the trees and so forth, still there will be the differences, varieties in the uh, produce. Therefore, we need adaptability on the side of the robots. 
for Dr. Nozaki? Uh, yes, please. Uh, your microphone is coming. In Japanese, may I raise a question? I am more interested in the fishery business. This is a minute question, but the fishing demonstration you showed in your slide earlier, is that something that I know that is going to be the further down in the future, but would you consider utilizing this technology in the fishing, not a sports fishing, but when the fishermen had to fish um, using uh, these kits, and uh, would you think that this is useful? There are two challenges in the fisheries. The first is working environments are very harsh. For example, if you would like to fish the tuna and you have to be in the ship for a long period of time, and also distance. But using this technology, people no longer have to go to the fishing area anymore because it is a harsh environment. So think about any work required to be conducted in a harsh area or the work remotely in the rural part of area. We will be able to maintain the appropriate level of quality uh, in usual um, area, and then we will still be able to do fishing or agriculture. People, human being, doesn't necessarily have to fish, uh, uh, do a fishing. If we were able to uh, provide the same functions, then human beings do not have to go to go on site to do fishing any longer. We are last question, so let's thank Dr. Nozaki for his presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And this will conclude the first part of the seminar.